Turn with me in the, your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, we'll begin reading at verse 19. Just before this, Paul has been traveling through Asia Minor, and he has healed a lame man in Lystra. And the people from the city want, believed that they were gods descended from heaven. Zeus and what was the other one? Barnabas they thought was uh, Zeus and Paul. I forget which two. Um, Zeus and Hermes. And uh, they wanted to sacrifice to them and Paul urges them not to do that, that they were just men, and then he preaches Jesus Christ to them. And so that has gone on just before the verses that we're going to read. And then we start in verse 19, Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, remember the multitudes had just wanted to worship them, they brought out sacrifices. Persuading the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the soul's of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. That's as far as we're going to read. You can keep your Bibles with you. People of God, isn't this a strange passage and a stranger mes message by Paul? Is this truly what would encourage people? Isn't this a negative, passage, a negative message of Paul going around saying people uh, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God? How is he going to attract seekers to the church? Isn't this a difficult teaching? And where did Paul get this idea? Well, the origin of Paul's exhortation comes from no one less than Jesus Christ. And if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to look at Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and following, we read, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, that is Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go, preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus himself was the origin of Paul's message. Jesus in this passage is confronting a very common temptation to accommodate God's kingdom to my conditions, to my desires. Now, Please, let us not misunderstand. There are many, many, many aspects of the gospel that are glorious. They are wonderful. They are beautiful. They fill us. We enjoy fellowship of Christians. We love to hear of the mercy of God from His Word. We like to sing. This church sings marvelously. <laughs> we like to sing. We enjoy coffee time together. <laughs> there are many good things about the gospel and being a Christian. But there are people who 
come to religion and to the church for secondary reasons. And then we put our own excuses to avoid the principal reason. You see, that's what's so subtle and terrible about sin. It allows us to substitute good things for the main thing. None of these people that Jesus confronts here were saying they wanted to go sin. All these things were fine. To say goodbye to your family, to bury your father, that's not bad. You see, sin allows us to substitute good things for the main thing and so assuage our consciences. These impulsive followers were all positive. They were happy. Lord, I will follow you. And Jesus rebukes each one. What was their problem? Was Jesus being too hard upon them? I'm sure that there are many people who have read this passage and they're like, "Ah, I think Jesus went a little too far with these poor people. Maybe we ourselves have thought that. And maybe it's because we have the same problem. You see, Jesus for them was not first, second, third, last, everything. Jesus wasn't their all in all. For them to follow Jesus, to be a Christian, to be a church member, was something good as long as it could be fit into my priorities. And the laser vision of Jesus Christ saw right through to their heart. Maybe these people expected Jesus to say, oh, oh, sh- okay, okay, I understand. Go ahead, uh, just hurry up. I'll be waiting here for you. But that would have been to flip things head down. That would be to flip over and invert who's Lord and Savior and who are the sinners in need of salvation. A great problem among Christians and in the church from Jesus' day till today is we have not learned to say with Jesus Himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will but thine be done. We want to tell God what we think and what we're going to do and then hope that Jesus supports our desire, our wills. The origin of Paul's exhortation to the Iconians and those in Lystra and Derby was Jesus Christ Himself because it was Jesus that placed Himself square in the middle of the kingdom of God. And Paul simply repeats what Christ had said. Jesus must be our all. Now, where does Paul get the idea through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God? Matthew 10. I'd invite you to look at Matthew 10. And this is a, a passage that's even more radical yet. But we need to see that Paul was simply communicating what Jesus had said in Matthew 10, verse 32. And you see, people, it's, it's necessary for us to understand the burden that Jesus had when He preached the Gospel. And this is necessary for our time as well. Therefore, Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, whoever confesses Me before men, him I will also confess before My Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men, him will I also deny before My Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow me, follow after me, is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. It is true, Jesus is a refuge. Jesus is the good shepherd for the repentant soul. Jesus' grace and pardon are a healing balm for our hearts. That is true. 
But Jesus never hid the fact that He has leashed upon the earth a tremendous conflict. Two chapters later in chapter 12, Jesus expels a demon from a man and He's criticized by the Pharisees. Oh, well, He's the prince demon Himself. How is He not going to be able to free demons? And Jesus says, that's not how it is. If I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, it's because the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Jesus says, basically, I'll paraphrase it, in order to sack the house of the strong man, there's got to be somebody stronger to tie up the strong man. Satan's the strong man. The house is the world. Jesus Christ came. He has bound the strong man. And He is sacking the demon's kingdom. And this sack of the kingdom of darkness has provoked a conflict. And this conflict is serious and it can be sad. Jesus uses the example of that which is most dear to our hearts, family. He, I'm sure it's not limited that that will be the only sword that He brought, the only conflict. It's not limited to that. But that's the most sensitive, isn't it? And Jesus presents family conflict as typical or an example of what might happen when Jesus Christ is Lord and King and Savior of our life. In this passage of Matthew chapter 10, Jesus affirms in terms which are impossible to to misunderstand that He must be the only and exclusive object of faith which admits nothing or no one else in between us and Jesus. And just so that people don't misinterpret what he's saying, because we're good at that. We're good at making something into something else or interpreting it in our own way. Just so that we don't do that, Jesus says, and furthermore, your confession of me is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. And that testing will happen when I throw you into the conflict that I've started. That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 38, Jesus says, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Essentially, he's saying, No cross, no crown. To bear the cross of Jesus in this world will be evidence of who Jesus is for you. Yes, a verbal confession is necessary, but more than a verbal confession, a life confession must accompany words. What brings us to church Sunday after Sunday? Do we come because we expect a message that agrees with our own opinions? Do we expect each Sunday to hear a message that is nice only and that affirms already my own thoughts, my own lifestyle? Of course we don't. We come to hear the truth, don't we? We come to hear the truth. And the truth, Jesus said He was the truth. And the truth is that Jesus is the only source of salvation and life eternal. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, Jesus says, He is the only source of salvation and life eternal. And the truth is that Jesus never promised His church that following Him in this world would be a bed of roses. In fact, He warned His followers. He said, in this world you will have afflictions. But confide in Me. I have overcome the world. That's what's important for us. You know, the church in Costa Rica had a a different history than many other uh, countries in Latin America because Protestants from England visited Costa Rica in the 1800s, they were a positive influence. They, 
became friends of the political leaders. They helped Costa Rica open up trade with England for coffee and for lumber. Um, actually, uh, Lille Schur used, uh, permitted his boats to help the Costa Rican army fight against enemies to the north. And uh, they earned, Protestants early earned a freedom uh, of worship in Costa Rica. And so the church in Costa Rica has never suffered persecution. But you know what? Tranquility and peace can foster laziness, can foster apathy. If the church does not use peacetime to push the kingdom forward, if we simply enjoy our peacetime, something terrible can happen. And I, when I shared this message in Costa Rica, I used the term holy fury. <laughs> we must keep burning a holy fury and not fury against men and women. It's against our own sin and against the kingdom of darkness. And in peacetime, it's difficult to keep holy fury burning because things are peaceful. Things are calm. We don't, we don't feel any conflict around us. In Costa Rica, there were good ministries begun in the 60s and the 70s. Some have completely disappeared. Other ones have lost their Christian character. And other ones are just at a very low level of, of activity. I think this past year's experience with the pandemic lockdowns and other things that we all experience in, experience in our different, different countries, I believe the Lord will sift, will have used this to sift His church also. They're saying in some regions that as many as 50% may not return to church. I'm glad to see a full church here. And I congratulate you. You see, Jesus is the one who says to you and to me, Dear follower, remember, no cross, no crown. And so Paul's not inventing, if we turn back to Acts chapter 14, Paul's not inventing some new message. As a faithful messenger, as a faithful apostle, he's simply communicating what Jesus Christ had taught. And this was the same message of all the apostles. It wasn't just Paul. Read Peter. Read John. Read James. Read June. Read the epistle, the epistle to the Hebrews. They all say the same thing. Jesus Christ is the center of the gospel. Jesus Christ is king. And we need to serve this kingdom with what we've called a holy fury. That is willing to sacrifice my, my own pleasures, my conditions, and even my fears before the cross of Christ. So Paul put in practice this faith, just as Jesus Christ had commanded us. You know, in chapter 14 of Acts, verse 19, just after the multitude wanted to worship Him and give Him offerings, uh, they stone Him, obviously worked up by other Jews who hated Paul and his message. And they believed to have killed Him. Now, boys and girls, uh, well, all of us, we've never seen a stoning in real life. Now, this had to be a terrible thing. You know, to kill someone by stoning, essentially you have to smash their head in. Because, and they were stoned, they weren't, they weren't pebbles, they were rocks. Uh, thrown against your body would simply bruise you. But to kill someone, they need to be knocked down and their head smashed in. 
And so when the disciples came to Paul after the multitude dispersed, they threw him out there, believing he was dead, didn't even appear to be breathing. Maybe he did die and God raised him. I don't know. Uh, they found Paul in a, in a, in a puddle of blood with his, with his body completely bruised and probably his head bashed in. That's how they find Paul. And what does Paul do? The disciples come and, and they're probably weeping. You know, they, 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 they find Paul and, and they gather around and what are we going to do? I suppose we should bury him. And, they, and he opens his eyes and, and, and he says, oh, someone help me up. And he gets up and, 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 and they take him into, into the city and he goes into one of the brothers' houses. And what does Paul do? Does he sit down on a, on a bench and, 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 and rub his head and say, oh my, this, this job's going to kill me. <laughs> uh, I, I got to find something. I got to find something a little, a little easier. You know, Paul was a tent maker. He could have said, I, maybe I should just make tents and I can support a local congregation with my tithe. Um, you know, what does Paul do? Read it. Verse 20 and 21. It says, um, they found, they, supposing him dead, however, when the disciples gathered around him, verse 20, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, the city where they just stoned him. Now, maybe, maybe someone is thinking, well, that was Paul. Paul was an apostle. I'm just a humble Christian that lives in Eastmanville or wherever around. And our church is just a humble little United Reformed Church. The only problem with that is verse 22. Who does Paul say? Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He says it to all of them. And there's a little word in the original Greek that Luke writes in day. It's a little tiny word, but it carries a lot of weight. It's necessary. And it always means just that. It's very cut and dried. It is necessary that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now there are two mistakes that Christians make with regard to our participation in the kingdom. The first one is some sort of social gospel, you know, that we humans are going to bring the kingdom to earth. And there's different versions of it, social gospel, liberation theology, that through human effort we're going to be able to establish righteousness on earth. Those movements usually fizzle out because the kingdom doesn't come that way and people uh, tire out and burn out and, and so usually those things basically fizzle out. But there's another error that we Reformed people are more susceptible to. And we might think, well, Jesus has done all of salvation. I cannot contribute to my justification. Jesus came and battled Satan and, and conquered Satan. Jesus went to the cross and was raised. He, he is the one who forgave me and who justified me. I cannot contribute to any of that. And so the only thing that I can do is trust in Jesus and wait for His return. Now that's a very serious error if you stop there. All of that is true, you see. All of that is true. But that's not the whole story. Theologians talk about the kingdom of God in a paradoxical term. Jesus established the kingdom, indeed. Jesus said, if I cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's broken in. Jesus said to Nicodemus, it is necessary to be born again to enter the kingdom. And if we believe in Jesus, we have entered the kingdom. And theologians call that the 
already aspect of the kingdom. It has been established. Jesus the King came and He has established His kingdom. His church is a visible expression of that kingdom. His church is the spearhead of His kingdom in this world, to, say, to put it that way. And yet, what does Paul say in verse 22? He says, through many tribulations we must enter. In other words, there's an aspect that we haven't entered. What aspect is that? It's the full consummation. The kingdom has not been consummated. It has begun. But it has not been fully consummated. And that's where Jesus Christ and the Bible, the entire New Testament, teaches us that when we trust in Jesus, Jesus has placed us in His kingdom conflict. The balance about on, these, on this position is that, yes, God is... Sovereign, 100%. Yes, God will give, receive the glory, 100%. And yes, God has redeemed us, body and soul, so that we might give ourselves, body and soul, 100% to His will. And what is His will? To cast out the kingdom of darkness. He's bound the strong man. And now He has recruited He's recruited you and me. That's why we're here. We've been recruited. We're recruits for the kingdom of God. And our work in the kingdom ends when God says you may rest. You know, the only way to silence Paul, you know what it was? Nero had to cut his head off. <laughs> Nero had to cut his head off. That was the last time Paul preached. And he probably preached right up to the minute that they cut his head off. So that's why Paul gets up and he continues his call, which was as an apostle. Now, we must ask the question, how many tribulations must we pass through? Paul says many. Paul says many. Not just, and I believe these afflictions are not just persecution. If, if, if they're persecution, we're going to have to do something to get persecuted because there's not much persecution, although that's coming. That's coming. And maybe we've avoided it too much. But afflictions in this world is serving faithfully. You know, even when we suffer a regular sickness, a regular sickness common to all men. When we suffer sickness, giving glory to God, giving glory to God, our neighbors and our unchristian friends see how we suffer affliction. How many afflictions? Paul says many. You know, the church that is tranquil, the church that is simply content, the church that is passive, the church that is indolent, the church that is lazy, the church that is fearful or individualist or the Christian who suffers from any of these things looks at this passage and says, you know, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't accept it. I like other parts of the Bible that are more positive. And they reject it. They simply say, not for me. So this morning we speak to those who have had their hearts softened by God's Spirit and their ears opened to God's Word. The ministry in Costa Rica, the reformed work in Costa Rica, just as anywhere, has not been easy. Now, I don't believe the reformed work in Costa Rica going into the future will be easy either. There have been afflictions. There have been losses. There have been sadness. been anguishes. And yet God has carried His work forward and He's given the strength necessary at, any, at every time. People of God, I don't know what your history has been and what it will be. But today is not the day to cease moving forward, to stop in the way. When we say that we must 
nurture or cultivate a holy fury. All we're saying is what Paul says. Persevere. Persevere. Faithful in the faith. Bearing affliction, if need be, for the cause of the kingdom of God. Afflictions for the kingdom will not come if we are not actively pursuing the exaltation of Jesus Christ and if we are not actively exercising holy fury. If your goal in your family is to simply have love and peace, no conflict, no nothing, you can do that. But if your goal in your marriage, the relationship with children, and your family goal in your neighborhood with your neighbors, if your goal is to be a kingdom family, it's not easy. It's not easy. It takes holy fury to do that. I'm convinced as we look at our Christian school in Costa Rica and the increasing pressure on, on school-aged children, the world right now in the kingdom of darkness desires more than anything the heart and mind of children. And I believe the war right now is raging at the educational level. You see it in the United States. We see it in Costa Rica. And if we are going to have kingdom education, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a battle. There already is. Now, God's not asking for us to have grandiose, visible ministries. That's not what we're saying today. We're not apostles. We're not apostles. We are humble Christians. God's not asking for great, visible ministries. You know, Maybe your ministry is real prayer for the kingdom of God. We have men and women who support our work. Maybe they can't even get out of their houses. And their ministry has been to pray for Costa Rica and we have seen answers to their prayers because only God could do what He's done in many cases. I don't know what God has called you to do in His kingdom, but He certainly has called you you know, when we begin to see this world as the theater of God's work, and when we begin to see ourselves as messengers of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who is only Savior and Lord in this world, I believe God will fill us with the joy, with the joy and with the strength to be worthy heralds of His glorious kingdom. How is it possible that this message that we just read, how is it possible that this message converted so many people in the ancient world? You know, as the church spread with this message of Paul, the Romans couldn't kill enough Christians. They couldn't throw enough of them into the lions. It filled the empire. The church filled the empire with this message so sober and so strange. How is that possible? It's because these Christians preached life eternal. Life eternal in Jesus Christ. And the coming, the coming of a glorious kingdom. They preached that message and their lives were a living testimony to that conviction. Dear friend in Christ, the work of Jesus Christ in Michigan deserves nothing less. Amen. Let's pray.